Hello, in this example, we're going to be looking at how to relate molecular features such as bond lengths and bond angles with some characteristics of the pure rotational spectrum. For example, the separation between lines that we know are related to the rotational constant of my molecule. For this case, we're going to use ammonia, which is a prototypical example for symmetric type rotors. Okay, so let's do it. We have a rotational constant. Uh, for ammonia that it's given in units of frequency, gigahertz in this case. Remember that we can also express this rotational constant in terms of wave numbers, and there's an equivalency between the two of them. And we're going to solve this problem really by addressing these ideas. First, we want to calculate what is the separation of lines that appear in the rotational spectrum. So we're going to come up with an expression that allows me to calculate that spectral line separation. The second is, I'm going to calculate two moments of inertia. The first one is that moment of inertia that comes just from the expression of the rotational constant. The other one is going to be a sort of more geometric type of moment of inertia for which I'm going to use the molecular parameters, bond length and bond angle, in relation with the rotational axis and moments of inertia that are associated with my molecule. And then I'm going to compare both of those moments of inertia. And if they're the same, then I can conclude that this rotational constant is in good agreement or is consistent with the molecular parameters that I know are for my molecule. So let's do it. Let's just start with defining some geometrical features and symmetry features of my molecule. I already addressed the idea that uh, ammonia is a symmetric rotor. And we know that the characteristic of symmetric rotors is that out of the three rotational axes, two of them are equivalent, and the third one is unique non-zero. And that's going to be, in, in fact, the principal rotational axis. Now, within these symmetric rotors, we have two types of them. The first one is prolate, which is what ammonia belongs to. In, in, in this case, the moment, the moment of inertia associated with the principal rotational axis is smaller than the moments of inertia associated with the two equivalent rotational axes. The other kind of symmetric rotor is called oblate, in which now the moment of inertia associated with the unique and or principal rotational axis is larger than the moment of inertia associated with the other two equivalent rotational axes. And these are the shapes that represent those kind of uh, geometries. Prolate on your left and oblate on your right. Now, from this shape, you could probably imagine why colloquially the prolate is called a cigar symmetry rotor, and the other one is called a pancake symmetry rotor. So I'll leave you with those images, sort of try to remember and correlate prolate versus oblate type of molecules. Okay, now what about the features of my spectrum? Well, the first one is we can calculate rotational terms, which is nothing else than the energy associated with rotational energy levels. And remember that these rotational terms is nothing else than the energy divided by the factor h times c, where h is the Planck's constant and c is the speed of light. And this tilde is an indication that these expressions are given in wave numbers. Okay, so but important features about this equation, the rotational terms, gives me the energies of rotational energy levels, is that I have two quantum numbers associated with that. And that should make sense because I have two distinct moments of inertia. This is also the same reason why, in this expression, now I'm finding two different rotational constants, a and b. With respect to the quantum numbers, remember that the, the possible values for the angular momentum quantum number j could be 0, 1, 2, and 3, and more, in principle. But k is actually tied to values of j. The possible values are going to be 0, plus, minus 1, plus, minus 2, all the way to plus, minus j. Now, the two rotational constants, each of them are associated with a particular moment of inertia. Rotational constant a, it's associated with the moment of inertia that is parallel to the principal rotational axis. And the constant b is associated with the two equivalent moment of inertia. And that is represented with i sub index perpendicular in reference that those are perpendicular to the principal moment of inertia. The moment of inertia associated with the principal rotational axis. And when you have k equals zero, the rotation is basically n over n kind of rotation. It's rotating in this fashion. And by using the right hand rule, we know that the angular momentum vector is going to be pointing in this direction, and it's going to be perpendicular to the rotational plane. With that, we know that the projection of that angular momentum onto my principal axis is going to be zero. So there's no component of the angular momentum in, uh, about the principal axis. If k is approximately equal to j, then we will know that most of the rotation is basically about the principal axis. And then you can see that also because the projection of the angular momentum onto my principal axis is going to be pretty much the same as the angular momentum. Okay, another thing that you want to think about in terms of the quantum number k is that this plus minus in this expression for the energy, we have plus minus k, but we have k squared. That means that the value plus or minus doesn't affect the energy, and that is just telling me that the direction of the rotation is not relevant for the amount of energy 
Let's start by calculating the separation between lines in my spectrum. The question that I can ask is, what are the allowed transitions among all the possible transitions that could occur? And for that, in order to answer that question, I need to remember the selection rules that apply. In this particular case, for these type of molecules, the selection rules are for both quantum numbers, delta J should be plus minus one, whereas delta K should be zero. Those are my selection rules, the allowed transitions. Okay, this delta K equals zero means the quantum number K doesn't change, and that is because there's this rotation about the principal axis of my symmetric rotor does not change the orientation of the molecular dipole in space. Particularly for ammonia, you may remember, and if you look at the dipole moment for your molecule, it's actually pointing in the same direction as this rotational axis, as this moment of inertia. So any rotation that I'm doing around this axis is not changing the orientation of that dipole because there's no fluctuating dipole moment that is interacting with the electromagnetic radiation that is causing these rotational transitions, K is not changing. Okay, so let's look at how can we come up with an expression that tells me what is the separation between the lines. Since we have already my rotational terms, I can think about transitions, but specifically transitions between levels that are allowed. Okay, so I'm applying now here the selection rules. Delta J should be plus minus one, delta K is equal to zero. Let's look at one of the sides of the spectrum. So let's take delta J plus one. So that means that every single time that J appears in my expression, I'm gonna substitute it with J plus one because that is the level where the rotation is, where the transition is going. So J plus one for the first term, second term J becomes J plus one, and then delta K is equal to zero. So this K is always K. It's not changing. If K was one, then K is gonna be one. If K was zero, K is still gonna be zero after the transition. Now minus the initial term, so what is the, the what are the quantum numbers where the transition originated? So because it went from j to j plus one, every single time that I see j, this is going to stay as j. And again, k is not going to change because delta k should be zero. So the same k at the beginning must remain at the end. Now with this one, you can see that the whole term a minus b times k square minus a minus b times k square is going to cancel out. So then I'm just doing a uh, rearranging my equation, doing a little bit of algebra, and I'm going to end up with 2b, 2 times the rotational constant times j plus 1. Now this expression is interesting because what it means is that even though in order to calculate the rotational energy for a particular level, I need to consider the second term that contains the, rotational, the two rotational constants and the k quantum number, when I'm looking at transitions, that element is gone. It's not even appearing here in my expression. So here you don't have A, you don't have K. So the second term here is not relevant for whenever I'm looking at transitions. And that comes just simply from the selection rules that apply for these rotational transitions for this molecule. Okay, now with that, you can see that the expression that I get is exactly the same as I had for linear type of molecules. And the spectral separation is, the spectral line separation is gonna be two times the rotational constant. So with that, since I already know what the rotational constant is, I can calculate the separation two times the rotational constant, and I'm gonna do it in terms of units of wave numbers and also in terms of units of uh, frequency, just because I can't do it. Okay, so if you do it directly in terms of units of frequency, since you already have the rotational constant in frequency, you just multiply that by two, and then you end up with the separation in those units. In order to convert from units of frequency to units of wave numbers, you have to divide that amount by the speed of light. So with that conversion, I end up also calculating what is the spectral separation in terms of wave numbers. Okay, now I can calculate the moment of inertia associated with that rotational constant. And when I substitute all the values, work out dimensional analysis or unit analysis, I find that the moment of inertia that is calculated using the rotational constant measure is gonna be this much, roughly 2.8 times 10 to the minus 47 kilograms times meter square. Okay, so let's have that in mind because now the next step is going to be we want to know if this rotational constant that was given or measure is consistent with the molecular parameters that we know are existing for ammonia. We're going to be comparing this moment of inertia calculated with the rotational constant with the moment of inertia that is calculated from geometrical features of my molecule. So how do I do that? Okay, well, if you look at the table from the handout, you have uh, the different types of molecules and the moments of inertia depending on the different types of uh, rotational axis that exists in your molecule. So please make sure to check out that handout and you should be able to recognize uh, based on the geometry of your molecule uh, to which one of those different groups that molecules belongs. Now in this particular case we know uh, that the geometry that I have here for ammonia will correspond to this particular symmetric rotor where I have two dif distinct moments of inertia, each of, each of them associated with the distinct 
rotational axis. And the moment of inertia associated with the rotational constant is that which is related to the equivalent rotational axis. So in this particular case, again, if you look at your handout, among these two different moments of inertia that you could calculate, you're going to be using the second expression, the one that is for the equivalent uh, rotational axis. Now, if you look at this expression, you're going to find out that you're going to be needing these functions of the bond angles. So, and those functions f1, f2 are also contained in your table. So f1 is this expression, f2 is this expression, and remember theta in this case is the bond angle for your molecule. And the three bond angles that you're going to have are equivalent with one another, so we only need to define one of them. The same goes with the bond length. We can we only need to define one because all of the other ones are going to be equivalent. Okay, with that, we we use that expression from our handout, the second expression here. And then I'm going to just rearrange my expression in order to sort of not to try to facilitate my work, not to enter too many numbers. So I'm factoring out r squared and also the mass of the hydrogen atom. And then I just come up with that expression. So this is the one that I'm going to be using in order to solve my problem numerically. So now I have this expression. I, I'm just going to substitute the correct values. I have the mass of hydrogen given in terms of atomic mass units in kilograms. I was already given the bond length in picometers. I'm just putting it here in meters for dimension and all unit analysis reasons. The bond uh, angles that are given here in degrees, and then the masses of nitrogen and hydrogen accordingly. When I solve this uh, expression numerically, I end up with a moment of inertia that is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 47 kilograms meter squared. So when you look at these two values, the one moment of inertia calculated using the rotational constant and the moment of inertia calculated using the features of my molecules, the geometry of my molecule, uh, they are both the same. So what we can conclude is this rotational constant, either B or B tilde, is consistent with all the molecular features that are given in the problem. We also learn about symmetric rotors and the two different types of symmetric rotors, prolate and oblate, and also where the separations between lines in the pure rotational spectrum for symmetric rotors come from, and that separation is two times the rotational constant. Okay, I hope this is helpful, and I'll talk to you later.